Thanks for having me here. Is the sound okay back there? Yeah? Great. So I'm um, uh, excited to see the crowd, and I'll try not to get distracted too much with the views here. But uh, it, it's, been a, it's been a fun time over the last, uh, actually, 20 years I've been working machine learning. And today, you see, basically every company wants to do something with machine learning. And so we're asking the question these days, how can you possibly trust these algorithms that are trying to learn something from data? It seems like a huge, massive leap of faith. And everybody wants to do it. In fact, my, my view is that within five years, every innovative, successful application is going to use machine learning at its core. You might call it machine learning. You might call it data science. You might call it AI. But it's going to be innovative in exactly this way. It's going to display intelligence. And this is a huge, massive thing. In fact, intelligent applications can provide tremendous amount of value. A well-known example with Netflix is about 70% of the views come from recommendations. So the recommender is doing a, a, a really great thing there. However, it's also well-known they spend about $200 million a year on the recommender team. So raise your hand if you have $200 million a year to spend on your recommender team. <laughs> So this processor is slow to build. Uh, they require a tremendous amount of expertise, and they're just really hard. So as we've talked to a large number of people over the last years, we've realized there's three core blockers in terms of uh, building things that use machine learning they're intelligent. The first one is for a variety of people, especially, I I'm sure it's not the case for you in the room, but for most people, mapping that business question to the machine learning algorithm is just hard. So, for example, if you want to build a recommender system and you figure out, I must use this thing, it's called matrix factorization, understanding how to uh, describe a, a recommender system as a matrix factorization algorithm is just hard, requires a lot of ex expertise. Even if you have that expertise, the second part of the problem is really pretty painful. That includes engineering features, iterating over models, trying uh, different possibilities, evaluating, validating them, and that uh, slow iterative process can be uh, hard and painful to execute on. But even if you've done that, and maybe your team has created something they feel is really cool, uh, maybe you use Python or R to do that, often you have to package that up and hand it off to another team that's going to translate that into Java or C++ to deploy it in production. And that process, which might take 6 to 12 months, basically ends up with something that had nothing to do with the thing that you built in the first place. And so these three pain points um, have really motivated us over the last few years to rethink how this process is done. So today I'll talk uh, very briefly about how us uh, at uh, Data, the company who spun off, think about the process. And then we'll dig into some research that we did at the uh, University of Washington that addresses the question of why you should trust a particular machine learning algorithm. And that really comes from the journey that we'll describe in this first part of the process. So uh, at data, the way we think about it is that we must address three problems. The first one is how do you get to value fast, even if you have uh, minimal machine learning expertise? How do you make that mapping uh, easy and quick? The second one, though, is that you don't want a black box solution where you, when you first finish it, there's nothing else you can do. You're done. You're stuck. You want the flexibility to innovate, build new things, and modify it in the, whatever way you want to do it. And finally, for us, that idea of handing over your code to somebody else to take to production is not empowering. It's annoying as a data scientist. I feel like whatever work I did is not valued if I can't take it to production myself. So we want to think about ways that make it easy to go from the beginning, from building your first application, all the way to taking it to the produ production. So these are the three uh, tenets that we work really hard on to accelerate that journey. Now, our goal really is to allow innovators, so this is uh, you and others, to create intelligent applications with a new kind of agile machine learning system. So that's our mission uh, at Data, and um, with the goal of accelerating this path from inspiration to production, let me talk a little bit about what we view uh, this production path to look like in a modern, agile way. So typically, you're going to start with an application you want to build. I want to build a new kind of fraud detection system that's going to update every uh, minute and uh, provide real-time uh, predictions within seven milliseconds. So that system is going to, in the back end, be based on some models that you learned from data. 
Now, translating those models into a real-time system is pretty hard and usually requires a lot of infrastructure. The way we think about it is in terms of microservices. You can package your models up in, in terms of this uh, small microservices, maybe tens of them, maybe hundreds of them, maybe millions of them, which in real time will provide responses to queries that come from the front end. And those queries can give you feedback. For example, the user clicked on this particular recommendation or this transaction was actually fraudulent. And we want to be able to close the loop. We want to be able to monitor when things are working or not working and in real time update uh, the models using online learning systems. So what you'll see is the ability to do all of these things in a pretty easy way. And actually, we allow you to deploy in whatever infrastructure you want, be it on, on um, premises or on a cloud service like AWS. So let's, uh, I'm going to do one quick example of this. We're going to do a little bit of coding in a second. I'm going to walk over there. And then we're going to jump into the uh, research that I mentioned the, uh, in the beginning. So let's say that you want to create a recommender system. They're going to recommend movies, but you don't want to spend $200 million on it. What you can do is, with a few lines of code, be able to uh, load your data, learn the recommender system, and deploy it as a real-time service. And then if you like, as you come up with the feedback, you can improve, modify it, or even add your own algorithm. So let's see a quick demo of that. Uh, I will step over here, because there's no wire in the podium. I hope this still works. Let's try it. All right, so what I'm going to show you here is um, uh, IPython notebook, uh, so Jupyter notebook. You guys probably seen this before, and so it's just a, a way to show code really easily on my browser. Uh, and we're going to import uh, GraphLab. GraphLab created is a library that uh, we've created, which makes it pretty easy to uh, uh, build this model. So I'm going to load some restaurant review data. I used to live in the Bay Area, so this is from San Francisco, and uh, reminds me of the olden days there. So uh, let's take a look at what that date looks like. So this is from Yelp. Uh, there is a, a few columns. There's the name of the restaurant, category price, and most importantly, the user who gave it a particular rating. And there's actual reviews of the restaurant and when it was done. So normally, you'd slice and dice the data in order to get a particular sense of what's in there and what kind of data quality you have. Um, because that process was annoying and slow, we create a little visualization tool where with one line of code, you can get a sense of what your data looks like. So we do one pass sketching algorithms to try to figure out what's in your data. So when you see uh, different columns, it's easier if I was standing in front, but you see uh, the most commonly reviewed restaurant in San Francisco is uh, Pizzeria Del Fina. Anybody? Yeah. Yes, yes, good spot, good spot. Perhaps surprisingly, most common reviews are about breakfast and brunch. And $2 signs is the way to go. So I get a sense of the data, and let's say that I like it and, I'm, and I think it looks pretty good. I want to build a recommender system for it. Um, you can choose from a wide library of different algorithms like matrix factorization and others, but if you just type graphlab.recommender.create, will automatically pick an algorithm for you. And in a few seconds on my laptop, I now have a recommender service, uh, a recommender model, which I can query and ask, you know, evaluate it, let's do some precision recall curves, let's do a bunch of different things on it. Uh, but instead, let's just see it in action. So um, I'm not a coffee drinker, but uh, a lot of people in my, uh, my team drink coffee, and I wanted to find a good place for us to get together. I heard that four barrel coffee was a good one. What are the places in San Francisco where might I get coffee? Any, any recommendations from the locals there? If, you, if I like four barrel coffee? Okay, yeah, well, let's see. Side glass, ritual coffee, blue bottle, <laughs> fills. Now, I, I'm more of this kind of guy. Anybody know amnesia in the mission? Dive bar, that's good. <laughs> Go to a dive bar, I want to do a little hopping. What are the places I might want to go? Well, I might go to Casanova Lounge, Dalva, Elbow Room, Makeout Room. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like uh, we, got a, we got a nice thing going here. So clearly, the model is working, and I trust it. And uh, hold on to those words in a little bit. 
Um, so I want to deploy this uh, as a real-time service so I can build, say, a phone app that uses it. Normally, I would have to take care of this all myself and think about the whole deployment piece. Uh, because the process was slowing down uh, data science, we created this tool that we call predictive services where I can connect to a cluster. Here, here I'm going to show you a cluster that's running on AWS. There's three machines. They host a number of different models. Um, they have versions you can explore, uh, look at their, uh, how well they're working, monitor them. Uh, but interestingly, with one line of code, I can take this uh, recommender model that I just built. Uh, what are you complaining about? Uh, oh, that. Sorry. Uh, I had tested the demo, and I forgot to remove the model. Okay, so with one line of code here, I can take this recommender model that I learned on my laptop and ship it off to an S3 bucket on AWS, and then those three machines are going to copy it out of the S3 bucket and start hosting the real-time service that you can call from a REST API using things like uh, curl, JavaScript, anything you want. Here I'm going to call it using uh, Python, and if I do so here, uh, it returns this um, JSON response that says, if I like Four Barrel Coffee, I might like Site Glass, I might like Ritual Coffee Roasters, Blue Bottle, and others. And interestingly, it also includes this unique ID here, which allows us to provide feedback loop where uh, if the user clicks on a particular recommendation, you can go back and update your model based on that. So that's where you can uh, build a system like this in a, in a few lines of code and deploy as a real-time service. Now, seems pretty good, and we have the tools to do it, but the question is, why did I think I could trust this particular model? Why did I think that it would actually work? So let's talk about trusting machine learning models. If you think about it, normally we think about this pipeline where we go from data to machine learning model to deploying real-time predictions, but the question is, how do I know that this thing is really working and how do I know that I'm not going to get fired once it goes into production? Uh, my student, Marco uh, Ribeiro, and my uh, postdoc, Samir Singh, at the University of Washington, have done some really interesting work that allow you to understand why a particular machine learning model makes a particular prediction. And they've evaluated it with a wide range of different user studies to show that it works really well. So I'm happy everybody signed the release form in the back before coming in, right? We're going to do a live user study here. So let's say that you use deep learning to solve a very important task. Note that we're at the University of Washington, so this is a really important task for us. We're going to take an image and we're going to know whether it's a wolf or a husky. For those who don't know, husky is the mascot of the university, and we always bring a husky to the stadium. Uh, we want to make sure we don't bring a wolf that's going to kill everybody. <laughs> and we're going to use deep learning for that. So let's say that we use some test data, and we try it, and the test data it seems to work well. Let's say for this example, this only makes one mistake, where it predicted a wolf, and it was really a husky. My question to you is, do you trust this machine learning model to take it to production and, not, and risk the lives of thousands of people in the stadium? <laughs> yes, trust it. Thank you. Any, anybody not trust the model? If you don't trust the model, is it because you don't trust me? <laughs> Wolves are scary. <laughs> so what, um, the question here is, why would you trust it? Why would you not trust it? So the work that Marco and uh, Samir did is really interesting. They, uh, uh, they do, a, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about it briefly, they do some perturbation of the images, of the inputs, and try to understand what parts were most important to making the decisions. If you look at this input and you look at this deep neural network, which is really hard to understand, but you ask, what was most important to make this decision? I'm going to show you images here, and, and the highlighted areas were the most important parts to make that decision. Now take a look at this and tell me if you now trust it. In particular, take a look at the ones that predicted wolf. If you look carefully, you'll notice that Instead of a wolf detector, we have a very fancy and deep <laughs> snow detector. 
And this is not just true with crazy deep learning models. Uh, how many people know the well-known 20 news groups data set? So this is a famous data set from about 30 years old for news groups. News groups are this thing. It's like a forum, which later was like a Facebook page, where you could post things about a topic. It was amazing. Um, anyway, there's this data set that's a, uh, been around for a long time where there's different categories like politics and religion and so on, and you had to categorize which, based on the text of the article, which were the, the news groups it came from. And basically, any modern machine learning algorithm gets really good accuracy in this data set. So whenever I taught a class, I said, oh, this is a solved problem. Here's a data set where it always works. But when you use um, Marco and Samir's work, you notice that the actual features he was using to make these decisions didn't make sense. So for example, the strongest feature was the email address of the person who posted the article. <laughs> Here the fact that Sean at gmail.com always posts in the politics blog does not tell me something about the rest, or, or, sorry, I should say not blog, uh, forum, doesn't tell me something about the rest. And in fact, if you remove those kinds of features, you only get about 57% accuracy, so it's not actually that good. So understanding why you make a particular prediction can help you understand if the model is working for the right reasons and can help you do other things in the process of going from a model to a deployment. So for example, Netflix, if you go, it tries to tell you, you might like this movie because you also like Lord of the Rings. But if you think about a doctor, if you have a system that says the probability that this person has cancer is 95%, the doctors basically want to ignore that system. But if you say, look at this MRI, look at this um, related cases, read these papers, you help make your own conclusions, that system will provide a lot more value to that doctor. And so trust is very important, not just in terms of understanding and improving the quality of the model, but also um, in uh, how these uh, machine learning predictions get used in the real world. And uh, what Marco and Samir did was, uh, I talked a little bit about it, it can highlight what features are most important. And the way it works is by taking the input data and trying to figure out where the key inputs are important for prediction by perturbing the data and fitting models locally around each prediction. And these models, uh, this, this explanation is then, then grouped around the space uh, to understand how does the model behave as a whole. And I, I encourage everybody to read the paper to understand a little bit more about how this thing works. But let me talk about a couple of examples of what happens when uh, Marco built a visualization of this and we put it in the hands of people. So if you remember, uh, Mark, if, if you took the 20 news groups data set and you remove those features uh, that didn't make sense, um, then you got a pretty low accuracy. Um, sorry, if you, if you uh, so, uh, the way I should say this a little differently, if you take, if you train on a training news groups data set, but you test on similar data that doesn't include uh, Sean's email address, you get pretty low accuracy. So what Marco did was clean the data, remove all the features that he thought did not make sense in order to make the prediction, and ask the following question. Is it possible to show uh, this explanation to mechanical Turkers that don't have any machine learning background, and with a few rounds of iteration, be able to get as close as possible to Marco's gold standard. So can a human that doesn't have machine learning background use explanations to improve the quality of the model? That was the question that Marco asked. And what he found was that within three rounds of mechanical turkeys looking at uh, the explanations, they were able to get better predictions than Marco's uh, gold standard. So I fired him. Just kidding, he's a great student. <laughs> it's amazing. But the, 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 what it does say is that the explanations are extremely helpful, even for non-experts, to understand why machine learning algorithm works and how it can be improved. And we've been pushing this in various ways. So uh, building trust in models is not just about uh, making it easy to build evaluation curves, ROC curves, uh, quantitative metrics. You want to be able to explore the models like we did with uh, restaurants in San Francisco to qualitatively understand why things behave a certain way. But, and it's important then to get explanations to understand why a model makes a particular decision and whether those, explanation, uh, those decisions make sense. And uh, these are all things that we're actively working on in order to build trust in the model. I call this three E's, uh, evaluations, explorations, and explanations. 
I mentioned how this is useful to improve the quality of the model. We've also been using it uh, to help people understand why machine learning makes a particular prediction. So here's an example. Uh, if you look at churn prediction, so this is deciding if people are using your product, are they likely to stop using it? We can provide very interesting explanations. So I'm not going to go through this visualization in detail, but we segment the users that are churning for similar, are likely to churn for similar reasons, and then provide those explanations. So let's say this group of users was always shopping in the toddler section of the website and then stopped shopping. Now a marketing person can take those explanations and create a campaign. It's pretty interesting, pretty natural what those folks are doing. You can try to target them in certain ways. So explanations are also good uh, for that kind of approach. And we work with uh, really interesting companies that do exactly this problem, churn prediction. Now, uh, just want to do one last plug before we close off. Um, how many people are taking the online courses that Emily and I've been doing? So thanks for joining them. Uh, I'd like to share uh, something that we've been, uh, the Emily Fox and I from the University of Washington have been doing for the last uh, several months, uh, nine months now, which is build a six course specialization in machine learning. And the idea here is a sequence of courses that takes you from uh, the basics all the way to kind of advanced techniques. But this is not like other machine learning courses out there, where you typically start with what's the probability of coin flips and build up from there. And hopefully by the end of the semester, you can quickly mention in the last lecture there are some applications of machine learning in the real world. Um, we start from the real use cases, like how does Zillow predict the price of your house? And then deconstruct that to explain regression and the underlying algorithms for it. Or how does Pandora figure out what next song you should listen to? And we deconstruct that to explain recommender systems with a relative reduction, matrix factorization, and more. And so you'll see the sequence. We have uh, so far about 60,000 uh, students engaged in it. And it's been a really fun process. And I, I, uh, I hope you all give it a try. So with that, um, to summarize by saying, there's a really exciting phase transition today uh, in this world that uh, we've been working on for quite a while. Where we're going from an academic endeavor that was about, you know, my curve is better than your curve type of thing, I just uh, write papers, uh, to uh, real world applications that are really being differentiated by the machine learning at their core. And I think our mission here is to create the new technologies that allow you to quickly create intelligent applications, gain trust that they're doing what they're hoping they're doing, both at training time and at production, and deploy them as services that you can connect to other parts of the organization in real time. Thank you very much.